started. So thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Odoreka Monde. I also go by Odie. I'm from the Community Foundation of Sarasota County. I'm the Community Knowledge Manager helping with planning our nonprofit trainings for the year. And I'm so glad that you can all join us today and that we have Tracy who will be leading this workshop today for you all to learn about plan development or development plans and for better fundraising every year. So um, this meeting is recorded. Um, if you wanted to take a look back at it afterward, afterwards, we will send the meeting out to everybody. And it'll also be available on our YouTube channel after the fact. Um, you all should have gotten some of the training materials ahead of time. If not, I'll also be putting a link to those PDFs after um, my announcements here. But so if you don't have it, you'll be able to access it through the links in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions during the meeting, you can either, I think there's like a hand raise button that you can do or put your questions in the chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat and let Tracy know um, during the workshop if we need to pause and then you can ask the question. Um, but yeah, I'll just soon hand this off to Tracy, but I just wanted to introduce Tracy Vandernick. She is the president of Philcom where she works both in person and virtually with nonprofit organizations around the globe to improve their fundraising and board governance. She has raised and worked with clients to successfully raise millions of dollars in annual funds, capital campaigns, major gift campaigns, and non-governmental grants. Tracy has more than 25 years of experience in fundraising, nonprofit okay. leadership, and business development. She holds a Master of Science in Management with a concentration in nonprofit leadership, a graduate certificate in teaching and learning, and is a certified fundraising executive. She is an Association of Fundraising Professionals Master Trainer, earned a Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Workplace Certificate from University of South Florida, and earned a Certificate of Nonprofit Board Consulting from BoardSource. Tracy has been published in Nonprofit Pro, AP Perspectives, and Stanford Social Innovation Review. So without further ado, handing off the microphone to Tracy. All right. Thanks, Odie. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I am going to share my screen. And once I do, <clears throat> excuse me, once I do, I am not really going to be able to see you or my um or the chat box. So OD very kindly said that she would sort of keep track of, of all the raised, any raised hands and, um, and anybody that has questions in the chat box. So is everybody right now seeing only the PowerPoint, nothing, nothing else random on my screen or notes? Does it look good? Okay. <clears throat> so here we are beyond the giving challenge get all those things out of my way. Here is my bio that you absolutely don't need to read again since Odie just shared that information with you. Just wanted to briefly touch on who is probably the best audience for this webinar or web workshop. Small and young nonprofits can use this as an opportunity to learn about development plans and the important role they play in your fundraising success. For some of the larger organizations that are on today, the session may help you update a plan that you already have or do any sort of course correction that you may be um, wanting to do in terms of your strategic fundraising. So hopefully it's uh, everybody across the board at different size organizations will get something out of today. Our big focus uh, is going to be year round fundraising and how to create and use a development plan that will help you fundraise successfully. You were emailed, uh, most of you were emailed work, two, work, two documents ahead of time. One is a worksheet and one is a template development plan. Um, Odie, if she hasn't already, we'll be putting those links to those in the chat in case any of you don't have them on hand. Now, it, it's worth noting here that, that different people in different organizations draft development plans in different ways. Um, for example, I work a lot with Network for Good, um, 
now Bonterra. And the development plan date template that they use is actually more of an Excel spreadsheet. And it looks more like planning communications by the month. Neither one is wrong or right. They're both, they're, they, they both work. It's purely the type of style of community or, or of the development plan that you're comfortable with and that you feel like your staff and your board would understand the most. Um, we're going to work today from the one that I use as a template. Um, and then of course you can afterwards then create any type of uh, project plans or communication plans later based on the information that you put in there today. So from that, what our journey is going to be, let's get started uh, by talking about what a development plan is and how it can help us target what our fundraising choices are, what your organizations will do for fundraising throughout the year. So just so everybody is on the same page and using the same language, first let's describe and define what a development plan is. It's an internal document that helps you plot your fundraising strategy annually. You begin with your total philanthropic fundraising goal, and then you break down the different fundraising actions that you will take that add together to um, equal that total fundraising goal. That's the simplest form of what this tool is. So what I'd like to do, um, there's about 60 people on now. We're expecting a few more. What I would like to do with um, Odie's help is do a quick poll, a couple of quick polls to find out who's here and, and what your, your, your main reason for being here is. Are you drafting a brand new development plan or do you have an existing plan that you want to um, upgrade, update, or change a little bit? All right, so, so far, about almost 70, 30. So, so, so that's a good mix. So those of you who are updating an existing plan, you know, take the pieces from what we talk about today um, and, and just use them how, how you see fit and how they work with what you've already done. Or take this opportunity to basically sort of draft a new one and then compare the two to see how you feel like they would be the most help to you. So Odie, I think we can end this poll. I don't know, oh shit, see, I was saying that and forgot that you can't all, you can't all see the results until we share them, sorry about that. So about 62% of you are share, are drafting a new plan and 38% updating an existing plan. So that's a pretty good mix. So we will we'll go on to the next one. If I can get that off my screen. There we go. The, uh, I'm convinced that it's Murphy's Law that the Zoom menu is always exactly where you want it to be to be able to click whatever you need to. All right, next poll. Does your organization want, need, want or need to diversify funding streams? Um, a lot of organizations focus their fundraising in very specific areas or um, receive funding from a, a small group or a small number of, of sources. Um, so we want to know if that's where your focus is or if, in fact, if you've been in operation for a while, if you're happy with where your funding is coming from, but you want to put this, um, put your plan into a, a written document that can be board approved that we, can, you know, today can serve that function as well. Um, all right, we have, um, looks like almost all our answers in here. Odie, if you want to share that poll, I, it looks like 92% of the organizations on today want to diversify their funding streams. And that is completely understandable and expected because many organizations have been relying on specific types of funding for years and realize that 
that can put them in a precarious financial situation if any one of those funding streams were to go away. <clears throat> so let's, I would like to ask you one more question and then we'll be finished with polls for now. I'd like to find out from each of you where the largest portion of your organizational funding comes from. Now, I don't necessarily mean fundraising. It could be that you are almost exclusively funded by government grants to this point, and you want to diversify from that. So I just want to get an idea of where the most of your funding is coming from. Okay, looks like. <clears throat> All right, you, you, you all are a, a microcosm of the, the philanthropic sector for sure, in that um, a lot of your donations are coming from individual donors. Um, oh, do I think if you want to end this one and show everybody the results, um, you can see that um, a lot of people, a lot of you have donations coming from individuals uh, in, um, as, as your largest source of funding. But there are 22% of you where your biggest funder is the government. It's somehow government grants or reimbursement grants. So there are, everybody, everybody always has room for improvement in terms of diversifying your funding streams. So today, uh, as we're going through this, just keep in mind, okay, I know that the majority of our funding is coming through government grants. And my organization is concerned that we may receive less of an allocation or that money was maybe moved over because of a disaster. So you want to uh, make the other areas that you use for fundraising more robust. Um, and that is the type of planning that we want to do today. So now let's look at the giving challenge. Um, almost everybody here, I think we have about 60 people on now. I'm gonna guess that almost everyone here has participated in at least one giving challenge uh, hosted by the Community Foundation of Sarasota County. It is a great region-wide day that helps get mission messages out to broad audiences that may not have known about your organization otherwise and it helps you all to secure funds to support those missions. But what we wanna talk about is the fact that the Giving Challenge is just one part of strategic fundraising efforts to support your nonprofit mission. You can see from this chart, the chart that Odie shared with us that the results from the 2022 Giving Challenge that an overwhelming number of participating organizations show that the Giving Challenge is significantly important to your overall annual budgets. Um, the smaller the organization, the more you all depend on the Giving Challenge every other year. And even for the larger organizations, the Giving Challenge, the importance you place on the money raised through the Giving Challenge is still weighted at over 50%. So that's a significant amount of, of uh, effort and um, fundraising, um, fundraising resources put into the Giving Challenge one day every other year. So the question is, becomes then, what do you do on the alternative years? What do you do when there's no giving challenge? Or what would you do if there was no giving challenge at all? These are completely rhetorical questions. It's not a poll um, because we are gonna go through all different ways that your organization can raise money today in addition to the good work that you're already doing through the giving challenge. We wanna make sure that you have the ability to strategically raise funds all year long, every year, so that you're not, so that your organization doesn't feel wholly dependent on the giving challenge. 
So as we go beyond the giving challenge into other ways, um, it's imperative that nonprofits focus on year-round fundraising so that you can be sustainable all year long. A lot of times we get in these uh, positions where we have to really allocate, you know, we raise the money all in November or in December um, or when the giving challenge is in March, and then we have to allocate that money out through the rest of the year to be able to sustain it. Um, when in reality, what we can do is spread the types of fundraising that we do out strategically so that we don't have those peaks and valleys quite as much as we may be now. So there's many types of fundraising out there that, that your nonprofit can take advantage of. Um, this is uh, this next two slides is just a list of all different types that you can try. Your organization is probably not going to do every single one. But you do want to meet your supporters where they are. And we always want to remember that it's important that when we fundraise, we're doing it in the ways that our donors want to interact with us, not just the way that we've been comfortable fundraising for decades or for a long time. It's outside of our comfort zone and meeting them where they want to be. So you can see some of the examples are, of course, your board of directors uh, fundraising campaign should come first every year at the beginning of the fiscal year. Volunteer and staff, corporations, direct mail. Direct mail is not dead um, and is still a very effective way to raise funds as part of an overall fundraising program. Uh, email appeals. Monthly giving is an area that we're all very much focused on because it helps us spread out um, and know what money will be coming in each month. And then major gift programs. Uh, the smaller organizations of you that are on today, you probably don't yet have major gift programs, I'm guessing. Uh, some of the larger organizations that are on may focus in on major gifts. And OD shared with me ahead of time uh, a breakdown of who is on the session today. And it's about 50-50 larger organizations and smaller organizations. So I'll try and make sure that the types of fundraising that we talk about really do cover what each of you may be doing at any given point in time. Here's a few more types of fundraising. Uh, now you can see that I included one that uh, does fundraising through streaming, whether it's influencers streaming on TikTok or whether it is gamers stream streaming through Tiltify and Twitch. Um, that doesn't mean that all, <clears throat> all of us are going to be using that, um, that type of streaming fundraising as one of our methods, but I shared it on here to show that it is a way that nonprofits are um, making strides in fundraising over the last couple of years. On this slide, our local organizations <clears throat> may be more likely to focus on special events, even though every time I, I say special events, I am compelled to point out that they have a very high cost to raise a dollar and uh, compared to other types of fundraising, so they should be used sparingly and mixed in with other, <clears throat> other fundraising methods. And then grants are very often used by, well, many of you probably use grants, but a lot of small nonprofit organizations start out their, their fundraising with solely doing grants. So we definitely want to help you move past that and start to do a mix of all of the different types of fundraising, or at least test them out to identify which ones work for you and which ones fit with the audience um, that you are cultivating to support the mission of your organization. So given that long list of choices, like we said, you're, you're not going to do every single one. You, you probably wouldn't have time to do every single one. But creating a development plan can help you make strategic choices for 
what fundraising actions you will take to make your fundraising program both strategic and manageable. Because it, you can have great uh, plans all day long, but if it isn't something that's manageable by the team that you have, or you are not able to expand your team to make that happen, then, then it isn't as useful a tool as it could be. So we want to make sure that everything that we create is always grounded in reality. So in terms of what a development plan is specifically, it defines your fundraising goal and then maps out the path to reach that goal. So it's basically where do you need to go and how are you going to get there? The development plan creates sort of a roadmap for the trip. Too often uh, when I ask nonprofit organizations how much they need to raise to run their organization at the optimal level, a lot of times I get sort of um, blank stares and, and people don't know exactly the amount that they would need not to budget at the lowest common denominator, what we call the poverty mentality, budgeting just so that you have enough to survive. We want to budget for the optimal version of your organization. And to do that, you have to have a clear picture of how much money it takes to run in that optimal way. The benefits of having a development plan, a written and documented development plan, is that it solidifies what strategic actions you are going to take. And it creates sort of a single place for you to, to put everything together. Um, running, uh, the, running cost to raise a dollar and the return on investment on each of your fundraising actions is something that we should all be doing all the time anyway. Um, and it, te it's technically, it doesn't usually, it's not part of those analyses are not usually part of your development plan. However, however, you'll notice in the one that we sent to you ahead of time, on the last page, I've shared with you the calculations for how to run ROI and cost to raise a dollar so that it's a constant reminder that every time you do a fundraising campaign or some type of action, you remember to go and evaluate how that went. Yes, you may have raised a lot of money, but how much did you spend to raise it? Um, did you have enough staff time to make it happen? All of that should be evaluated as you go throughout your year um, conducting fundraising, fund development. More benefits of having a plan is that it helps you to allocate resources. And this can be very helpful when you have different groups. You have you, you have your board, you have your executive, you may have a development committee, and everybody may have different thoughts or ideas for how your organization should be raising funds. So when you're trying to allocate resources, you're one, allocating human resources. How many staff do you have? Do you have enough staff to implement event after event after event? Or would you be better served if some of those staff focused on different fundraising activities that have a higher return on investment? Now, in terms of planning for financial resources, the question is, you only, you only have a certain amount of money to be used to raise money. So where that, that fundraising budget, the budget you have that you can use to run your fundraising all year long, do you have enough to be able to do the types of fundraising that you have been doing or that you are planning to try out over the next couple of years? Now let's, look briefly at who creates the plan. We're going to look at stakeholders <clears throat> and who is involved in the creation process of the plan. In a minute, we are going to look through each section of the template of the plan. 
so that, um, and you're going to have time, we're going to split out some time so that you have time to work on your own organization's plan and, and draft the backbone, use the information, create the information that will be the backbone of your development plan for the next fiscal year. But first, let's take a quick look at who should be involved in the process of creating the plan. So the, the obvious answer is you, because you're here today. So you're the one that is the, the main creator of the development plan. Now, some of you may be development directors, some may be executive directors that don't have paid development staff. Regardless of the position that you hold, you're the one that is going to be putting together the, the backbone of the fund development plan. You're the one that has access to the numbers of what the organization has done in previous years for fundraising and how successful those things have been so that you can use that information to plan going forward. Now, if you have a development committee, your next step after you create the plan and discuss it, agree on it with the executive director, um, you're, you're going to share that plan with your development committee if you have one. And you're not really looking for them to make really significant changes to it. What, you, what, you're, what you're looking to do is talk them through it, maybe explain the rationale, and educate them about why you need such a plan so that then your development committee members can be champions for the plan and for you uh, in fundraising when you bring it to the board to get approval. So by the time you present it to the board, after you've talked to the development committee, you've made any necessary changes, by the time you present it to the board, they shouldn't be making any significant changes at all to your development plan because the process is in place so that your board can look through it, make sure they agree with it, but trust the process. They trust that you know what you're doing in, in strategically planning fundraising, and they trust that the committee, the development fundraising committee of the board did their work in evaluating and looking for anything that maybe needed to be updated or changed so that by the time it gets to the board, it should really be the finished product. Um, it is also good to have somebody from the development committee um, as your partner when you present it to the board. So it is sort of a, a peer relationship um, between you, the staff, um, somebody from the development committee and the board as a whole that you're sharing this with. And the end result that you want to have happen is you want to end with getting a board approved plan document, um, a board approved plan that's documented in the board meeting minutes. Um, this way, the board is agreeing to the role that they say that they are um, going to play in fundraising. <clears throat> and you'll see in a few minutes, um, the descriptions of how the board will be engaged and involved. So if you get, if you create this, you present it to them, they approve it, they sign off on it. Then if you get a few months into the year and you're not getting the help and, and feedback and effort that you need from board members you and, and other staff members, you can kindly remind them that they approved this specific strategic fundraising strategy um, and ask them politely, of course, to hold up their end of the bargain and do the work that they agreed to that was in this development plan. Now, this is also a place that if you are paid staff, you definitely want a board champion, um, somebody from the development committee or the executive director probably to be the one that has this conversation with the board if you're asking them to, to amp up the amount of work they're doing to, to match 
what they agreed to in the development plan. That way it isn't paid staff asking the board to, to do what they said they were gonna do. It is more the peer relationship of another board member holding them accountable to what they said they were going to do. And it's, it's important to keep in mind that we always want the board and the committee's buy-in on strategy. You're not inviting them in to make decisions at a task level. Like for example, what the topic is going to be of a direct mail piece that you're sending out. That, that's not a level of detail that the board needs or needs to be or should be involved in. But what you do want them to agree with is the overall strategy of having direct mail as one component of a larger fundraising strategy. So as long as you keep it at a higher level, you don't run the risk of inviting everybody in to make desk level decisions, if that makes sense. Okay, the slide before last, we covered who creates the plan. It's you, it goes to the committee, uh, it gets updated and then it goes to the board. I also just wanted to point out who some of the other tangential, if you will, stakeholders are in the success of the development plan and thus the su success of fundraising for your organization. These people, the clients, um, recipients of your mission, the community at large, the organization's board of directors, partner organizations, all of these groups benefit from you having a successful strategic development plan. Are they ever going to see it? No, it's an internal document. They're not going to work with it, except for the line that says the board of directors, because they have that fiduciary responsibility. But the reason I mention these is so that you can have in the back of your mind as you're creating your strategy and your uh, fundraising plan is that all of these people are affected by how successfully and positively you raise money for the organization. So they're sort of our motivation for why we are doing this exercise of creating something as in depth as a development plan. So um, Odie, do uh, we have a couple minutes here set aside for questions? I know that was a lot of information just describing what the development plan is and who creates it. Um, have you seen in the chat that anybody has any questions so far? No questions in the chat so far, but is there anyone that wants to put a question in the chat or unmute themselves and ask a question? I see Karen. Karen, you have your hand up. A question too. Um, uh, my question is, Tracy, how do you uh, view um, membership dues? Uh, which my organization uh, collects membership dues annually. How do you view that in the mix of the fundraising goal? Should that be a completely separate entity? Since you're basically in paying dues, you're paying for some services, mm -hmm. uh, you know, newsletter announcements, invitations, et cetera. Um, Karen, a, a lot of, a number of different types of organizations uh, use a dues model like you just described. Um, and I think the answer to your question depends on what type of organization it is. Um, for example, uh, if you're an arts organization and you have shows to put on, um, a membership or a dues model can make sense because you can tie it to something that they're receiving, like um, meeting the actors before or after a show. Um, first access to see a show, something like that. Other organizations that use membership models tend to do it at a smaller level. Like um, I believe Equality Florida is one that uses almost strictly a, an events and a, and a membership or dues-based model. And, um, and actually, um, I started my fundraising career at American Red Cross, and they had previously had a membership model where 
people paid, I, I don't, I'm not even sure what it was. I think it was a $15 donation a year to become a member of Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And then we were coming in and, and trying to build relationships and fundraise from those people afterwards. So th this is just my own opinion. Um, but my own, my opinion is that dues like that can make it a little bit difficult to get to um, increase to larger gifts because yeah. the expectation is set, okay, you paid your $15 or $100, whatever it is. So their mind is then out of the fundraising realm. Yes. However, there is, um, there's dues, but then there's also um, sort of a mix of monthly giving. It's a, it's a way of giving now that they call the Netflix model of fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, it appeals to a lot of younger donors in that um, it, it's basically a monthly giving program or process where they set up their debit card or credit card to have a certain amount come out every month. And like Netflix, they don't see it ahead of time, really. So it doesn't matter much, but they do get something in return. Yes. So whether it's T-shirts or, you know, some type of tchotchkes, the Netflix model does give them something in return. But in general, in my opinion, membership um, dues and fees can make an extra level of work for you yes. as the strategic fundraiser. So um, that was a long answer to your question of should it be counted in the budget? I think um, it, de it depends on, it depends on a number of things, but you could sort of, because uh, it, it depends on if your fundraising department is the one who's responsible for getting those members or if they become members through the program department and then your job is to build on that. Yes. Um, so I would sort of, sort of, I would keep it in the budget, but sort of keep it off to the side yes. as a, we don't necessarily want to focus on this potentially, but we do want to assume that those people are really good prospects for bringing in closer to the organization trying to educate them more about the mission and then hopefully increasing their level of participation and um, their gifts at, at, at the, you know, the same time. Yes. Helping them distinguish between their membership dues and then gifting on top of that. So, yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. that. Absolutely. Does anybody else have a question or? Yes. Mary Ann. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Mary Ann. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Ann, and I am the founding director of the Spaces Art Foundation. And we're very new and we're very small. And um, my question is for the development plan, you mentioned that there would be the goal of setting the optimal version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if I present that to the board, if they would say I'm not being realistic. So, or maybe there's a way to tweak and in between of, you know, maybe optimal in five years or, you know, or optimal in three years. So if you could talk a little bit more about that, mm -hmm. thank you. And yeah, that's absolutely a valid question. We want to be working towards the optimal version, certainly. Um, and I know, Marianne, at one point um, you worked on having a case for support and organizations that have a case for support have generally focused on here's what the best version of our organization would be. And here's what we want it to look like in one year, two years, and three years. So that, that dollar amount is going to be a uh, something that you're reaching for and that you can show why you want it to increase over the couple of years to get to and expand that optimal level. But I completely understand what you're saying that you're not, you may not be living in that world at this very moment of the optimal level. Um, and you need to ramp up your fundraising to get to that point. So, so yes, I think it is, um, I think it, it does happen that we have our, our budget for the year as it is now. Um, and that may be what you have to focus your fundraising on. But what I would suggest doing is 
fairly regularly now that um, now that five and ten year strategic plans are are just not realistic anymore. If you fairly regularly every you know twelve to twenty four months update a strategic plan, so that the the with the board, so that the board can identify where they're trying to get, what is the organization trying to achieve, what are your goals and objectives, then you can assign the dollar amounts to that. So for example, if we want to do this, we need to raise X amount more money for a one, uh, one person, one extra staff member to make that happen. So it, it sort of puts you a little bit in the position of, okay, here's our, here's our regular budget for all the time, but here's the projected or aspirational um, budget. Um, and I don't love the term aspirational budget because it, to me, that seems like a, um, a sales tool or, or a marketing budget where it's like, okay, here's where we think we can get to. And the marketing team is going to put like this, this huge dollar amount on top of it as our aspirational goal. So I never want to set people up to be in that position, but I do think that there's a difference between inflating goals and knowing what your realistic goals would be for running at the optimal level. I think if you separate those two out, you'll be in a good planning position. All right, I'm going to keep going, uh, but there will be other times to, to ask questions throughout. Uh, we're going to get uh, a little bit more right into the work. So if you have the, the worksheets that Odie put in the chat or that you were emailed ahead of time, we're going to work with the worksheet and the template now so that you can start working on some of your own information. For today's purposes, um, in an effort to simplify, if you're not sure what your fundraising goal is, um, a, a, a safe way to just guesstimate it for, for what we're, we're doing is you know, take your, your full organizational goal and separate out um, earned income and separate out federal funding, uh, fee for service, anything like that, and use that amount as your, your overall fundraising goal. Hopefully you all know what your overall fundraising goal is. However, I've worked with many organizations um, whose board sets the, um, their fundraising goal for the fiscal year or sets their, their revenue goal for the fiscal year. And it, it's based, um, not always based in reality, uh, and an example is I, I encountered one organization whose board actually increased their fundraising goal year to year, 2000%. And when I asked them, you know, what's the catalyst for that? What's, what's different at the organization? What happened that, that makes you feel like it's possible for you all to raise 2000% more this coming year than you did last year? The answer, the answer is, well, nothing. We just want to raise more or we just need to raise more. And, and that's just, it's not realistic. Um, so as you are working with, um, if your goals are not already set, as you are working with your team to create your goal, just make sure that if you're increasing it, it's at reasonable increment, increments and that um, you are not choosing pie in the sky goals just because it's somewhere that you want to get. Now, in the, in the worksheet that you received ahead of time, there was um, some, some space to put your historical fundraising data for your organization. Now, all the time, we always, whenever we are forecasting, we want to use at least three years of data. What type of fundraising did you do and what, how much money was raised by each of those types of fundraising? However, if you throw in a disaster or um, an emergency or some type of episodic event like that, um, it's going to skew your numbers. So especially a disaster like the pandemic that had a, a, a disproportionate 
disproportionate effect either in higher fundraising or lower fundraising for different organizations, we want to take that into consideration because we don't want that anomalous year to, to skew what we think we are able to raise or what we think we should raise going forward. So when we're working through that, <clears throat> we want to base our predictions on something realistic. So if you have more than three years of gift data, you can go as far as five or more to look at, okay, we always raised, I don't know, say 500,000. We've raised around four or 500,000 for five years. And then during the pandemic, because we're say a food bank, it, it shot up and we raised a million for in that year and a half. And then you're, you're in the position now of fundraising or um, forecasting for what's going to go forward. Do, can you forecast based on that um, COVID-related billion-dollar year, or do you, do you forecast based on what your previous levels were? And, you know, there's not, there's not, I don't think, one hard and fast answer to that, but I think it's realistic to budget somewhere in between knowing that it's going to be effort on your part to try and keep and turn those episodic donors into long-term supporters of the organization. But the numbers just tell us to it, realistically know that um, episodic donors, like when I worked at American Red Cross and there was um, an earthquake or floods, there's always gonna be a spike in donations there but not all those donors are gonna stay. So you will be setting yourself up for some difficulty if you base pre, uh, pro, coming year's numbers on an anomalous year that had something specific happen that changed the numbers drastically up or drastically down. Odie, this is, uh, are you ready for our, yep, there we go. She's always ready. Um, now let's take a look at, we're getting ready to, to go through each section. When you prepared for today, just I'd like to get an idea for how many years of data each of you are using um, in preparing your development plan. Some, some organizations that are very small or very new um, or who have not yet begun using a donor management system, you may have a harder time getting that gift history, that data that you need to be able to make these strategic plans. Um, but you can make it one of your separate strategic priorities to either use a donor management system or set something up at your organization that going forward, you'll be able to track gift, gifts in such a way that you will have what you need to be able to forecast going forward. So, uh, Odie, if you want to end this one and share the results, it looks like 55% um, of you have three years of data that you're using, and 29% have four or more, and 16% have uh, basically no, no gift data that you're going to be using. So I'll try and keep that in mind as we go through um, each, of the, each of the sections here. All righty. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing the information with us. This isn't just an image of the worksheet that you received ahead of time. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take three minutes for you to fill out, if you haven't already, the total goal for your organization's budget. How much is the whole organization budgeted to um, have in revenue for this coming fiscal year? Um, then how much is your fundraising goal? Oops. Then how much is your fundraising goal? And as many years as you have, fill out what was the method you used for fundraising and how much was raised by that method. So for example, um, if you did a direct mail, if you you did direct mail in 2022, how much was raised by direct mail? If you did special events in 2022, how much was raised by those? 
those are the numbers that um, we're going to fill in here. So I am going to stop talking and I'm going to put three minutes on the clock so that you can all uh, begin to fill that out as just a, a tool that you can use throughout the rest of the session. Um, like I said, I will stop talking. If you have questions, put them in the chat. And as soon as we're finished, this will answer as many of them as we can. All right, you have just over a minute left. Okay. Uh, how did that go? Does anybody have any questions um, or anything you'd like to address about um, just identifying what your past three years of fundraising have, have brought in? We have and it's, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. two questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, the first one was from a little bit earlier. Is there a value to multi-year plans versus annual only plans? Uh, I would suggest, and, and the industry standard is to create a uh, fundraising, a development plan every year, um, have it ready for the beginning of your fiscal year and have it board approved every year. Yeah. Right. And so, then... so in that respect, it's separate. It's different than a strategic plan that may be for a longer period of time. Development plans are always for a specific fiscal year. Gotcha. And I think that answers the next question for while they were doing the worksheet, Yvonne asked, should we put our organizational budget and fiscal year fundraising goal for this year? Uh, yes, whichever whichever you want to work on. Those of you who, who your fiscal year is the same as the calendar year, it makes your life easy. Um, because fundraising plans um, are internal, we, they go by fiscal year. So if your fiscal year starts in July, I would create your development plan to start in July. Um, so unlike our um, appeals that may go online and you know donors think about fundraising in terms of calendar years, they don't care what our fiscal year is. They, they count calendar years and that's it. 
but um, you do want this to go in terms of fiscal year. So if your if yours is starting coming up anytime soon um, or even in October, um, you can plan for next year. Or if you're just starting this fiscal year, if you're started in January, I would write it for the fiscal year that we're sitting in right now. Okay. All right. Apparently I really wanted to know if you had any questions, so I put it in there twice and we'll move on. Okay, so this is, uh, you were sent a fillable PDF. You can, um, if you have it, you could choose to type on it, um, write on it, a printed copy of it, take separate notes today. However works for you, however your brain works is fine. After this session, at some point, you'll probably want to take all of this and just create your own version of the plan. Uh, like we said earlier, some of you will um, think it more in spreadsheets um, and each of you will have different categories based on the uniqueness of your organization. So yes, this is a template, you can type in it, but it's not going to serve every purpose that you need. So we certainly um, you know, do expect to, uh, to make an updated version for yourself uh, at your office. Oh, do, you, uh, do me a favor, please, and, and would you read the introduction paragraph to this Absolutely. slide? Absolutely. Fundraising to secure philanthropic support for blank organization is the responsibility of the board of directors, organization executives, and paid fundraising staff and or fundraising volunteers for organizations that do not have paid fundraising staff. Each of these stakeholders must make a commitment to both give financially to the organization and to fully engage in the strategic fundraising process. The board of directors is obligated to help the organization connect with, build relationships with, solicit, and steward others in effort to successfully fund the organization's mission. Great, thank you. Um, and you, you might be wondering why we why I focused on that specifically, is that um, in my version of development plans, which I've put together over years of working with different organizations, um, I know that the, the development plan, because you're getting it approved by the board and the development committee, if you have one, will see it, it is the perfect place to help educate those groups about the fundraising process. So even though you're going to be focusing on numbers and breaking down what type of fundraising you're doing, you, I always use uh, a, a development plan as a place to educate board members about what the expectations are for their involvement in fundraising. So you're likely to use it as a tool the most, but by them approving it, they are saying, yes, we, we are 100% bought into the, the, the strategy that you're using here, and we're agreeing to what we said we were going to do. Um, so there are sections in here that may be obvious to you, but they're worth including so that you can use them as, as educational sections um, for other uh, internal stakeholders like board members that are going to look at it. All right, let's go through the plan step by step. Um, you don't have to write anything yet. We're going to stop for five minutes shortly so you can work on your own plan. So we'll just um, go through the slides here briefly. First thing we're going to do is put in your total fundraising goal. So if you're following along in the template, <clears throat> This is your the goal for philanthropic fundraising. Uh, it's the one you entered earlier on the worksheet. You can just move it over here. Um, it does it, it does include grants from private foundations. Um, it should not include government grants because they're they're their own beast, right? They 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 sort of live in a separate world. Um, it should not include earned income or uh, fee for service. So it is very specifically only philanthropic dollars, which does include grants from foundations. So we're gonna add that number. 
Second thing we're going to do is write in the categories of fundraising and the dollars to reach the goal in each of those categories. Now, after you've added your total goal, you're going to, let me see if this, nope, I didn't, I didn't make that so it gets any larger. Um, after you've noted your total goal, you're going to look and add the goal for each category of fundraising. So here on this one, you can see individual fundraising, annual corporate partners, fundraising events, non-governmental grants, United Way, third-party fundraising, plan giving, all that good stuff. And keep in mind, these categories will be based on what your organization does or what you want to test out doing. Um, one thing you'll notice on here is that, or you know, on the sample that you have uh, at your desk with you, is that the individual contribution section is broken down into a lot of categories and, and or subsections. Sorry about that. Um, and the reason for that is simply because we would have that it would be a ton of categories and things to track if we had them each have their own section. So we just made those subcategories because they all fit within individual contributions. Whether it's a major gift that you asked for person to person, whether it's a direct mail that you sent mail to their house, whether it's an email that you sent to their office, all of those are asks of individuals. So that's why we lumped all of those together. Um, you can, can, can organize, of course, these in whatever way makes sense to you for your organization. And uh, don't forget that it's, it's unique categories for you. And what this may look like is um, animal rights organizations might look different from arts organizations and different yet from social services organizations that serve children. Um, and an example of that is the arts organizations, they may hold more events because they have a venue there. They have something that they're showing off and it makes sense for them to tie events into say their major gift fundraising. Whereas social services that serve children, very often you can't do tours or do anything where they would, you know, potential supporters would interact with the children at all. So their fundraising may focus on building an audience in a, and sharing their mission message in a different way, whether it's online, via email. So just keep in mind the type of organization that you are and what type of fundraising and communication makes the most sense for you. So now we're gonna stop for five minutes and have you go through this slide. Um, it's basically the information that you put on the worksheet. Some of it you'll just be able to move over to this slide. Um, and if you have questions, again, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll address as many as we can at the end. For organizations that are very small, um, do the best you can. If you don't have any gift history, um, at least, you know, if you have, if you know what, maybe, maybe you just have a founder, if you know what the founder invested last year, or if you just have a board and no staff and, and there wasn't a ton of fundraising, you probably still maybe did something for the giving challenge, giving Tuesday, something like that. So any, anything that you have like that, that you can put in here um, is going to be useful. So I will stop talking now and set my timer for the five minutes so that uh, you all can can put your information in there, or like I said, yours will look different. So if you want to start a, a different um, chart of categories, you know, please feel free, of course.
We have uh, two minutes left. All right, I'm going to come back on about 30 seconds early just because it looks like a number of you uh, may be finished and um, we can use the time to ask uh, or answer a few questions if there are any. Yeah, one in the chat from Joyce, she asked, what is considered a micro donation or roundup donation? Micro donations and roundup donations, they're basically the same thing. It's uh, you work with a vendor that um, you basically sign up with them and any of your supporters can, ah, sorry, there's your, there's your timer. Um, any of your supporters can sign up and tie their credit or debit card to an account and everything, every purchase they make will roll up to the next dollar. So it's like if you go to CVS or Walgreens, a lot of times they'll be doing it for the American Heart Association or Big Brothers, Big Sisters. It's that at a, a micro scale in that you're doing it just for your own organization. And a lot of small, uh, a lot of younger donors like it because, for example, they can say, all right, I want to, um, I want my debit card to round every purchase up to the next dollar but my, my cap is $15. I can afford to donate $15 this month. So it'll round up every purchase until 15 and then stop. And at the end of the month, the charity will get that amount. So it's, it's micro donations because it raises it pennies at a time, but it's a, um, it's a good way to um, enable people to give in, in small increments that work with their budget. All right, we good, Odie? Okay, all right, so we will. Now you can, some, some people, some organizations would, would stop here. Uh, you can see in the template that I shared with you that it even says, if you, if you wanna stop here, you can use that data as a sort of monetary summary um, of here, here's the goal, Here's what we're gonna you know, do and the dollar amount that's assigned to each one. Um, we, on the other hand, are going to keep going right now so that we can go past the monetary part and move into the sections that discuss how you're going to meet each uh, objective to go with each of those categories. So we did total goal, categories of fundraising dollars. Now we're gonna look at a more detailed breakdown. So whether you see it on here or on the document that you have, we're going to drill down for more detail in each area. For example, uh, we want to know not only the amount each type of fundraising is expected to secure, but we, we want to know what the objective of each category is, uh, what, how much time, what time will be spent on the work, uh, what, what, what work will happen, and who the main person is that's responsible for making it happen. There is the direct mail answer. 
Here are a couple more breakdowns, the online giving fundraising event. I just picked a couple at random. But as you look at these, you can see that they can very much be used in the same way that that introduction was used to ed not only educate the, the board and the development committee, but it can be used one for, for you and, and your staff to de define why you're doing this. Um, if it's, um, let's go back and look at direct mail. Direct mail is a good um, vehicle for acquiring new donors. It can be good for sharing mission impact. Um, you can target different audiences. There's, there's different objectives for the different types of fundraising. So you can share that here so that um, not only you can keep it in mind, but when you share it with development committee and the board, each of them understands why you're doing that. So you'll get hopefully less questions like, you know, I, I thought direct mail was dead. You know, nobody, nobody responds to direct mail anymore. And that, that actually, as I said before, isn't true. And in here, you can describe some of the ways that you can target direct mail. You can also put in here what, ty what time of year you plan to do such activities. So for example, if you plan on doing three direct mail pieces a year, uh, one in April, one in July, one in November, you could put those on here. Um, and then who the responsible party is. Very often it's gonna be the development director. It might, if you don't have a development director, it might be the, the, the board member volunteer that's in charge of fundraising. Um, but that way, anybody who's looking at it on the board or on the staff knows who to go to if they have a question or who they need to report to that they've accomplished whatever the task was. Um, and you know, there's, there's a couple of caveats here that um, we don't want to include a ton of information. So for example, we've said, we're going to do three direct mail pieces this year, one spring, one summer, one end of the year. What, we, what we're not doing is making this like a full um, project plan. We're not laying out what the topic is going to be of every direct mail piece, who specifically we're targeting in each, et cetera. Um, that's, too, that's more detail than is appropriate or that you want to see in your development plan. You want to keep it a little bit more high level and strategic than that. We have a question, Tracy, about direct mail. Sure. And from a small nonprofit, they asked that they would think direct mail might be very expensive for a small organization. Do you find this to be the case or is it worth it for a small org? Um, as always, the answer is it depends, but um, on the type of organization and if you know the demographics of any of the supporters, but you can do direct mail pieces inexpensively. It doesn't have to be big, pretty glossy pictures. It can, um, uh, you know, brochures or anything like that. It can literally be just a letter with a photo printed on the letter. Make sure you include a, a donation card return envelope with it. So for depending on how many people you have, you can choose to do a direct mailer to just, you know, a couple hundred people or less. And the return that you get is likely to at least be enough to cover the cost of the mailing. Um, and even if that's your goal the first couple times around, that's perfectly fine. And then as you build your list, um, you can you can increase the amounts um, so that you can do a little bit more expensive uh, mailing. But honestly, letters with um, that focus on mission stories and um, that have a a full color photo are are very effective. Um, and I know the direct mail marketers out there would be cringing because you know there's there's a lot of pieces that are involved there. But um, I think small nonprofits can do them very um, successfully. And 
there are different demographics that use direct mail in different ways. So for example, a, uh, an older boomer may use direct mail. They'll get it, they'll write a check, they'll mail it back. I'm a Gen Xer. Um, the, the trait that we supposedly have that I admit I fully, this is, this is I could have, they could have based it on me, is we'll get your direct mail, we'll open it, we'll look at it, then we'll go online, research your organization to see how we feel about you, and then donate online. So the direct mail, you, I didn't end up giving through the direct mail, but it was the catalyst that inspired me to research your organization and then give online. So there can be a couple different uh, valid uses for it there. All right, this is our, uh, our, our, the last one, our last uh, five minutes. <clears throat> um, so um, you can open up, uh, you know, work on a couple of those sections. Um, determine, you know, put in what your objective is for a certain category. What fundraising actions are you going to take? Like if you're talking about special events, what's the objective? And fundraiser, um, let's just say that's not, not a reasonable objective uh, as a fundraising category. A fundraiser is, is a completely different thing. And sometimes um, they do have their place, but because this is something that we want to use as a fundraising tool, we wanna make sure that there is a dollar amount associated with it. So include that objective. Um, the action, again, if we're talking about special events, if you have one a year or two a year, you can say, say that, say there'll be two a year or what month they'll be in. And then who is the main person that's responsible? Um, do you have, is it your development director? Is it a, an events committee? chair, um, whoever it is that is going to be the main person that's responsible. Um, if you have staff, if you have paid staff, they're most likely always going to be your first person that's responsible. And then you can add in volunteers, the, you know, the board chair, et cetera. But you, the staff person is generally the person that's going to be the glue that, keep, that keeps everybody together and provides them the, the tools that they, that they need to be successful. So uh, once again, I will stop talking and um, set the timer for five minutes so that you all can work on a couple of the categories. And then we'll come back. And if you have any questions or if you want to share any ideas or suggestions or areas that were interesting to you about um, how you want to assign objectives, um, the what's, the why's, the how's with these different fundraising categories.
Actually, Tracy, it's 158. And I know I'm sure some people might have a hard stop at two o'clock. So I was wondering if we can move it along. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, I know that uh, we have a, a cool announcement from the Community Foundation that we want to make sure to get to. So um, uh, I know we've, let's see, we, uh, we still have a good number of people here. Um, so what I will do is um, share with, um, share with you at the at the end of the document, I added some uh, sheets in there or some information in there about how you can um, use each or um, evaluate each fundraising action that you take um, by evaluating the return on investment and the cost to raise a dollar. <clears throat> and in a minute, I have a slide with my contact information on it. Um, if you have any feedback that you that or questions on that that last section about assigning your um, your objectives, or if you have any questions on anything we talked about today, feel free to uh, to email me or um, ask me through LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, but just keep in mind everything we talked about today can help you enhance your fundraising strategy organize the work that you do um, and hold your teams accountable. Um, and all of that, all of this is very, it, very monetized, um, very business specific going through all these categories. But just keep in mind that everything that you, you, we talked about today and everything that you're doing is for the sole purpose of supporting the work, the mission that your organization delivers on. So all of this, all of this planning and preparation is so that your organization can, can offer the best version of itself to the people that you serve. So from, from me and from the Community Foundation, thank you so much for the work that you do. Here's my contact information. And since you'll have, um, you'll have this uh, by video, um, you can go back and find it at any point, along with my email address and my uh, where my articles are on Nonprofit Pro, in case you're interested in that. And then, drum roll. Yeah. Your, your exciting news from uh, Odie. Are you ready for that slide, Odie? Yes, absolutely. All right. Giving Challenge 2024. It's official, everyone. April 9 through 10 from noon to noon, we will be hosting our ninth giving challenge. And we just wanted to announce it to you all at the Beyond the Giving Challenge <laughs> fundraising <laughs> training. So it's a little ironic, but yes, no, we hope that giving challenge, give, giving challenge is a huge part of an overall strategic plan for the whole year. So it, it's it's a it's a great thing. Thank yes. you so much for everybody for, for being a part of what we uh, what we talked about here today. Sorry, go ahead, Odie. Yes. No, but if you have any questions about the giving challenge, that email, I'm sure you all are aware of it and know it, but you're welcome to email us. Um, I put in the chat a feedback survey if you all have time to let us know how this training went so that we can continue to provide trainings and nonprofit workshops for the community. That would be great. This training was recorded, so we'll also be sending that recording out to you, as well as the worksheets and the templates again, if you need. And we also have another fundraising related training actually next Thursday about GiveGap's peer-to-peer -peer fundraising suite. If anyone's interested in that, you're welcome to uh, sign up for that. And yeah, if you want to stay on later to ask Tracy and I questions, feel free, but it is 2.02, so we understand if you need to get going. But thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, Joyce, I saw that you uh, asked a question in the chat. If you want to stay for a second, I'm, I'm yeah, happy to answer it. Yeah, I would it. love to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the question was, I believe, for smaller organizations, is it worth doing a year-end campaign? And the, the answer to that is always yes. 
Um, the, the number one reason that people give um, that they don't give to charity, uh, that they supply that they don't give to charity is because no one asked them. So ask when you have the opportunity and it's, it's something we've done it to ourselves as an industry. We've created this scenario where the lion's share of giving comes in in November and December. And it would um, be ideal if that stretched out over the whole year, but we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't evolved past that yet. So uh, November, is November, a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, it, it tends to be the best time to, to start your year-end fundraising appeal. You can tie things all together. If you do direct mail, email, social media, Giving Tuesday, you can tie them all together with specific photos, specific um, appeal stories. Just make sure that when you're doing an appeal, no matter what time of year it is, that you always focus your language on the donor, the people who want to help, and on the community, whoever is going to benefit from your services. So as opposed to saying, we need your help or support us to reach our goal, uh, it's always more effective in fundraising to say, um, your dollars, your investment, your help can help make this person's life better in X ways, um, showing that impact. But tying your language to the people who want to help and the people who are being helped um, is, is always a, a very positive way to, to go when you're talking about storytelling for your mission. And you know, it's not his fault, but because of the glut of campaigns that you see at the end of the year, you don't find smaller organizations get lost in the shuffle then still. Uh, no, um, I think that, you know, that can probably happen maybe a little bit on Giving Tuesday, um, because unlike the Giving Challenge, where the Community Foundation does the lion's share of the work. You know, they do a ton of marketing. They, they host the platform. They, they do all of that. So it's easier for small nonprofits to focus on the message um, so that they won't get lost in that, um, in, in the throng. But on, on Giving Tuesday, because everyone has to do their own work, their own marketing, their own websites, everything like that, that can be where larger nonprofits uh, fare better fundraising wise, um, at least anecdotally from what I've seen than some small nonprofits because they don't get lost in the, in the fray. However, having said that, I have worked with a number of small nonprofits who they just focus on telling their story well and compellingly on days like Giving Tuesday and leading up to it. And they've raised for what for them is a significant amount, whether that's 1,500, 5,000, 10,000. It may be a small amount to some other nonprofits, but for these very small nonprofits, it's significant and it's worth doing. So, so yes, there's, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of information out there from a lot of organizations, but um, the more you diversify what channels you're communicating on and the more you focus on impact and telling your story in a compelling way, the more you will rise above, um, I don't wanna call it the noise, but you'll, you'll rise above the fray of, of everybody um, that is fundraising at the same time. And I should appreciate the community foundation's work. <laughs> yes, 100%. It, it, it takes a lot of, of resources and effort for them to put on the, um, the, the giving challenge. So it's, and not all communities have something like this. And even those that do, I work with a number of, of nonprofits in different states like Minnesota, there's Give Min, which is a giving day for all of Minnesota. Um, our community foundation of Sarasota County um, puts on one of the most successful ones that I've encountered um, working with other ones. So yes, we're, we're very lucky in this community to have that as a resource. 
Uh, hello, this is Harvey Brooks from the Sunco Center for Independent Living. And Hi, Harvey. Um, did I just see on the screen that um, the Giving Challenge is um, in 2020, April 9, 2024? Uh, yes, I will reshare that screen. Sorry about that. Can uh, everybody see it now? Okay, I see it. Okay, okay, I got it. No problem. I, I should have left it up there. I just closed it so that I could see everybody's faces. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to share it again so that you have the email address and everything in case you uh, have any questions. Oh, okay. Great, great. Thank you. Anybody else have any last questions before we go? All right. Looks good. Thanks, everybody, for spending your afternoon with us. We greatly appreciate it. And as I said, I'm happy to be a resource here. And I know um, OD and team are, are always a resource as well if you, uh, if you want to contact either one of us. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much. This was very, very enlightening. So thank you. That's good. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Bye-bye.